So, good morning, everyone. Welcome. Today we have our first Food for Thought of this year, and we're glad to meet each other in this way again. And from now on, we will organize these inspiration sessions once a month, just before or during your lunch break. And my name is Leontine Born. I work for the Knowledge Center of the Faculty of Digital Media and Creative Industry, and we are the organizers of this meetup. Today's the subject for the Food for Thought is fashion, look backwards to move forward, and that means how can historical technology function as a driving force for a more sustainable fashion future? We're happy to have two experts on this theme, and first it's Maaike Feitsma. She's researcher at Fashion Research and Technology, and Roberto Luis Martins. He works for the platform Modemuse as a community manager. Before I will give them sort of the floor, I have some practical notes. We would like to ask you to drop your questions in the chat. And after the presentations, we will pay attention to most or maybe all of them. This Food for Thought will be recorded and you can find it later on at the website of our Knowledge Center FDMCY. And please put your microphone on mute as much as possible. For now, enjoy the session. And I would like to ask Maaike Feitsma to start. Okay, thank you. Leotine, I'm going to share my screen so you can see the slides. Okay, so. Can everybody see the slide? Okay, good, good. So, so welcome. Um, so today I'm going to tell you something about a research project that uh, hasn't started yet, but uh, we got the funding, so hooray. Um, and it will start in the beginning of 2022. Um, why? Because uh, more or less directly after this presentation, I'm going on maternity leave, so I won't be here for a while. Uh, so in the meantime, if you have any ideas, uh, for example, to collaborate or interesting uh, other projects or, or items or objects or whatever, please uh, send me an email uh, and maybe we can, we can uh, work together in, in, in some sort of way. Uh, I will show my email address at the, uh, the ending of my presentation. Okay, so it is a plan, but this is it. Um, and then the first question is, I think, you know, where did the ID for the project come from? Well, what do I see around me? And I'm very aware, you know, this is a, a bubble I function in, you know, at Amphi within a fashion context. But this is what I see. Maybe you see something different. But uh, so on the one hand, I see a lot of unhappy consumers. Here we see one of them. Um, and they are looking, they are searching for a way to do fashion in a more sustainable way. However, how do you do this? And then, on the other hand, I also see in a lot of unhappy fashion students. This is the central hallway of Amphi, uh, and it was the morning after the big climate protest in 2019. Fashion, fashion students cost the earth. So there is a lot of um, there are a lot of students also searching for a sustainable way to do fashion. Um, but how do you do this? That's the question. And when I speak to colleagues uh, at other Dutch fashion design schools, so not just at Amphi, but you know nationwide or internationally, I often hear similar st uh, stories. So students with, uh, yeah, would be, you could call it a climate depression. Uh, which translates into actually sort of they're not daring to make any clothing and are thinking about doing a documentary, a website, an app or some sort of other product uh, that does not involve making garments because simply they don't want to contribute to this big clothing mounting that is already there. Then The question is, and this is also a central question uh, from the Amphi, uh, at, at Amphi, how to make fashion a force for good? Well, 
often sustainable fashion is linked with high tech innovations. However, these are not accessible for the average consumer, nor for student designers, because simply you have a lack of funding. Um, so this proposal aims to explore a, a radically different path towards a more sustainable fashion future through technology. Um, so what is the case? Well, usually research on fashion and technology focuses on high tech innovation. And as a result, it overlooks knowledge that has already been out there uh, for centuries and it has been used, it has been tested and it has been improved for all these different, for over uh, hundreds of years. So putting these elements together, this project does not only look to the, to the future, but it aims to look backwards to move forward. Uh, because it argues that high technology are not the only answer. They are part of the answer, but not the only answer. And that cultural heritage, cultural fashion heritage can be meaningful and a source of inspiration to help solve all these different uh, contemporary uh, issues concerning fashion and durability. So, in other words, it aims to invest, investigate the blindingly obvious uh, and ask the question how historical technologies could be used to solve contemporary and uh, env environmental issues in fashion. And the idea is that technology from the past could inspire consumers, fashion designers and technologists to come up with new and exciting solutions to make the future of fashion more sustainable. Um, because in the past, a sustainable attitude towards fashion was the norm, simply because uh, textiles and garments were expensive. Therefore, people made fashion last instead of fast. And they did this through all these different types of low technologies, which are easy to learn, to apply, and you do not need any costly tools. So I want to research these technologies, provide an overview, um, and I wish to provide students and consumers with both hands-on uh, tools as well as knowledge. Um, well, I, 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 I think uh, I don't need to tell you, but fashion at this moment is one of the most polluting uh, uh, industries in the world. And this fast fashion system that we have nowadays, um, have with, with uh, all this trend driven uh, clothing at extremely low cost is uh, forms the basis of this problem. So it really has to do with some sort of attitude. And the question is how to make this connection between high tech and low tech, between the future and the past or the past and the future. Uh, and what do I actually mean with historical tech? Well, Usually when people think of uh, technology, um, they imagine something high tech related. Uh, we can also see it at the, 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 the flyer for this event with a model uh, dressed in some sort of uh, uh, retro sci-fi inspired uh, outfit, outfit and uh, wearing these sort of Star Trek uh, style glasses. So really uh, futuristic. So high technology equals uh, uh, um, sort of a, a sci-fi sci um, experience or view. The same goes uh, when, when, when you do a quick search on, uh, on a 
books on this uh, th this topic. Uh, here we see a techno fashion, fashion world technology, and fashion and technology. You really see this futuristic sci-fi images. However, and uh, I guess the reason is uh, that I am a fashion historian. When I think of fashion and technology, I don't immediately see this this sort of futuristic uh, images. Uh, but I see, for example, I think about this book, Dress, Fashion and Technology, uh, from, the, from prehistory to present. Um, so in short, uh, when my colleagues uh, think of uh, high-tech, uh, uh, high I think of low-tech. And that's because, of course, technology is not just about the integration of technology and garments. It's not just about the use of computers or 3D printers or scanners or 3D, uh, 3D knitting machines or even this, uh, this, this vintage uh, woman powered uh, sewing machines. Technology at its most basic um, is the use and understanding of tools, techniques and processes that use these tools. So, this gives a quite a different view or starting point for an exploration of fashion and technology. Uh, so for me, it's also about using very basic tools and techniques. You can see here, someone knitting. Um, and, it's, and it's all about low tech, it's about history. Um, and I think that just because something is from the past, it's low tech, it doesn't mean that it has become obsolete. Um, like for example, uh, uh, outdated high tech, such as phones and computers, which you can see here, just we throw it out in the trash. Well, not literally, I hope you all uh, recycle, but you know, when it's, when it's old, I get a new phone and I throw the old one out. Um, I think on the contrary, when you look at historical technology, this can be a really good uh, force for a more sustainable fashion future, a source of inspiration. Um, and exactly because uh, it is low tech, I think it can inspire both uh, fashion designers or student fashion designers and consumers and also empower them. Uh, because after all, it's something they can do themselves without the need for high tech and you know very expensive technology. Now, please don't get me get me wrong. Uh, I'm not going you know trying to, to to get us all to go back to this sort of make do and mend attitude and aesthetics that we saw, for example, um, during and shortly after the Second World War. Um, and I also do not think that we sh should start dressing like our forefathers did in traditional dress. Um, but what I do argue is that more knowledge of the technologies that are used in traditional dress in the past could lead to uh, interesting and even high tech solutions to our, uh, our contemporary problems. So. What do I wish to do through this uh, project? Well, I wish to set a change in motion through three different angles. Uh, first of all, being an alternative attitude towards fashion. Um, I want to um, create awareness and provide easy accessible tools um, for, for, for consumers and, and fashion designers to take action and I want to provide inspiration. So how am I going to do that? I'm going to explain that in the next couple of slides. Or I hope to do that. Um, so firstly, showing an alternative attitude, uh, an historical attitude towards fashion, um, which will, I hope, create more awareness and provide an easy and accessible way to take action for consumers. So very, you know, a, a, a low level uh, solution. And, you know, to, to give an uh, example that uh, this can be high fashion, this, this attitude. Um, 
because it's not about creating a new attitude, but by simply revaluing an attitude from the past. This is a book by Constance Wiebaud from 1957, uh, Fashion and Style. And uh, at the moment, uh, at, at that moment, Constance Wiebaud was uh, probably the most famous fashion journalist in the Netherlands. Uh, she, she even worked uh, for a while in, uh, in America for Women's Wear Daily. So this was really the creme de la creme of Dutch, sort of the Dutch fashion scene. And this is the time, you know, you have to think about Dior, uh, the new look, um, very, very, very elegant, very old couture. And she wrote this, uh, it's, a, it's a small booklet for, for, for women and how they can be fashionable and stylish. And um, nowadays we would expect all this talk about designer wear and high fashion and using the right makeup, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, things like that are also in there, but there's also uh, a chapter on how to make your clothing last. For example, by two, uh, two pairs of uh, high heels and uh, chase them every other day. Because when you wear a, a pair of shoes one day, they get a, a bit uh, sweaty. And if you leave them to rest for a day, then they will last you longer. And, you know, all these very sort of practical tips were in this very uh, uh, high fashion uh, publication. Um, so making your, uh, your, your clothing last could or, or was fashionable, and I think it could be fashionable again, instead of this throwaway uh, uh, attitude that we know nowadays from um, fast, fast fashion. So the, 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 the second uh, uh, angle, um, I want to create a deeper understanding of historical technologies, which provide more the makers. So the first one is really also, you know, for the average consumer, and this is more moving towards makers. So this could be amateurs, uh, students, professional designers, uh, and I want to provide them with both hand-on tools as well as knowledge. Uh, both to apply one-on-one, -on -one, but also to get inspired by an experiment and then innovate. So an example that already exists is uh, this, it's wool filler. And um, um, it is, was inspired by the technique of darning holes uh, and tears, for example, for example, for in your, in your woolen socks. Um, well, darning stocks sounds very uh, uh, old fashioned and, and, and boring, I guess, to most people. But they used it to come up with a fresh, new and exciting solution for uh, making your clothing last. Um, they came up with a, a needle and a system which lets you darn your holes by just sticking the needle repeatedly through the wall. And this binds the fibers together, resulting in a small felt patch. So they did not only take something from the past, the technique, and you know, you made it uh, relevant for for for, for uh, the nowadays consumer. They also um, came up with a new aesthetic. Well, ex you know. And this needs a bit of a footnote because a new aesthetic in the West, for example, in Japan, repairing your clothing is a sign of, of, of beauty in a nutshell, but in the West it isn't. However, wolf filler sees it as a sign of beauty. So they, um, th these, these uh, repairs can be invisible if you use the same type or, or the same type and color of uh, wool. But what they say is, no, 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 use a different color wool and show everybody around you that this is a cardigan you love and you've owned for ages. Um, so, so basically, the longer you wear a piece and the more holes you mend, the more personal your garment will become, the more interesting and, you know, the more fashionable. Then the third angle. Um, the third question I want to address is how can these uh, old-fashioned 
uh, solutions inspire uh, avant-garde production of garments. Um, so in other words, how can these historical solutions be translated and updated through contemporary technologies? So I want to bring together both um, experts of fashion's past and experts of fashion future, so the technologies, and sort of try to build a bridge between these different uh, worlds and then different realms of knowledge. Because at the moment, all these different worlds are highly separated. Uh, fashion historians basically stick to their museums, uh, craftsmen to their workshops, designers to their catwalks, and technologists to their labs, on average. Uh, but what would happen if all these different disciplines would uh, meet up and join forces towards finding um, solutions to our current, uh, for our current fashion problems? So, an example uh, that, that already happened, which is sort of um, um, a high-tech uh, solution, uh, um, inspired by the past is uh, the technique of folding. The technique of folding has been applied for centuries. For example, here we see a Dutch uh, 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 jacket, and this is from a video. The link is uh, underneath. Um, very interesting video created by uh, the Sales Museum. Um, and um, Basically, this jacket is not uh, cut into a certain pa pattern, but it's folded. So all the uh, material you don't need to make it fit around your body, it's just folded into the uh, jacket itself. Which means that when uh, this is a lady's jacket, when a lady gets pregnant or she gets older and she, you know, she, she gains a little weight, uh, the only thing she needs to do is um, uh, um, readjust the folds and she has uh, a new uh, jacket uh, made from our old jacket. So, so basically making a jacket in this way is more about um, origami than about patterns and pattern, pattern cutting. Then when we look at uh, uh, quite a recent uh, fashion uh, brand, we see here Petit Pli. It's a London-based brand, and uh, um, it is uh, the, 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 the head designer is an aeronautical engineer. And uh, what happened, he was, uh, uh, you know, his, his, his friends and his family uh, started getting kids. And he was so impressed by the fact that uh, during the first three years of their life, children go through so many different clothing items because simply they grow so incredibly fast. Um, so what he did, he, 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 he created a suit, a children's suit, which can be worn from about three months to three years because it is folded and you can just simply stretch it into a larger size. And this company describes itself as a wearable technology company. Um, so here we see a high-tech solution starting from a low-tech technique like folding. And I'm not saying that, you know, this, 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 this designer was inspired by this uh, traditional Dutch uh, jacket, but he was inspired by a very traditional technology. Um, and here I have another slide just to illustrate how this works. So you can simply stretch the fabric and suddenly you go to a very different clothing size. Um, so I hope that I'm somehow uh, convinced you, or at least, you know, I'm, I'm, of course, I'm going to do this, this through the whole project when it's, you know, when it's finished. But um, to, to have explained my idea that in the end, high tech and low tech are not necessarily two worlds that are, you know, uh, so far apart that this can be bridged. And also that um, making this connection could lead to interesting new solutions. 
So in short, how am I going to do this, uh, this, this project? Um, basically, there are two stages. First, I'm going to do an exploration of historical technologies that focus on the preservation of clothing and also look at how these techniques are still being used by contemporary craftsmen. Then, when I have some sort of overview, I want to bring together fashion historians, designers, craftsmen, technologists, and see what happens if they start experimenting together, brainstorm and brainstorm about the possibilities of these techniques to solve these uh, uh, contemporary fashions, uh, uh, fashion problems. So, in short, I want to recognize all and explore all this knowledge and inspiration that can be found in fashion heritage and see how it can be solved to, uh, 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 to solve contemporary environmental issues in fashion. And this is my email address. If anybody wants to email, email me later on. Um, and then I'm going to give the floor to Roberto. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh. oh. Uh oh. All the spoilers. My All the spoilers. All yeah, I'm sorry. It's, really it's, it's like a trailer of my uh, oh. of the presentation. Like I can imagine it as if it was a trailer. Anyway. Hi everyone, nice to meet you. My name is Roberto Luis Martins. I'm a freelance curator and researcher, uh, but also a community manager for Modemusa. Uh, oh, the presentation. It's happening with the slides, yeah. Well, uh, yeah. yeah. Yes, super. Um, and for the ones who are not familiar with Modemusa, Modemusa is an online fashion heritage platform where in multiple um, collections such as historical or contemporary uh, fashion collections of museums are gathered, but where also there is a very um, diverse community which um, um, create or write blog articles for uh, the platform. <clears throat> Uh, but first, um, I will take you to six years ago because the platform uh, exists, I think, this month, six years. Um, next slide, Michael. Uh, oh, yeah, so no, wait, is this the next slide? Yeah, no, anyway. Um, so we, uh, the museum started as uh, with the idea of gathering uh, collections. Uh, and and started with only seven museums with the whole idea of, yeah, how can we uh, create this digital um, space wherein we can expose our collections because due to fragility, we're not able to showcase them in exhibitions such as in paintings. This was just a, uh, an, uh, an, um, a slide where we now are 18, uh, uh, we have 18 partners, but it started uh, with just a few of these and now we have like this complete big uh, or we have this very large spectrum of different collections so we have not only ethnographic collections such as the the collections from the uh, uh, museum of world cultures but also theater collections of Oleg Pearson or municipal collections such as museum Rotterdam or um, yeah, Saudi Museum, Central Museum, so, uh, so very diverse and very different type of um, collection forming. And what what is interesting is that the platform started with the idea of digitalize, digitalize, digitalizing. Oh my God, um, the collections, but uh, uh, but also to place them next to each other, so to see all different parallels or to, to create this idea of, yeah, what, what, what is else um, uh, in, in other collections? So really to create bridges to all these fashion collections and come together as one. My idea, uh, Mike, next slide. My idea was to start with this slide so that I could show like, okay, and now the, the fashion objects are in depots and, and are not, um, um, 
accessible. So with, with Modern Music, they wanted to make these collections accessible for researchers, uh, for just all kinds of um, modally fabbers, so people who are interested in fashion uh, and to create these bridges for them. Next slide. Uh, this is just an image I like because it, it um, for example, this these dresses are from the collections of Central Museum and are not are so degraded in fa fabric, so they are not. Uh, it's not able to exhibit them in their in like on a busta with with their silhouette very accentuated. So with these with this this form of digitalization, it it helps to um, yeah to to create that bridge. <clears throat> anyway, next slide. Um, so through in the last six years, um, uh, you see that there are just so many collections that fill in each other. So um, we see here a, 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 an image of um, five or more than five centuries of fashion history and um, that every museum uh, has like this specific highlights. This image is made by Lisa Widdle uh, and then on the top um, it says five centuries of fashion and costume histories but uh, but also with white blind spots because for a long time these collections have been uh, uh, collected very specifically or very from a very particular angle uh, but uh, so very much based on this high uh, um, or rich white um, wearers or makers in in the past, which now is being uh, re re um, refilled, and it's very it's with all these collections next to each other, their their gaps being oh well. Um, Filled, but but still, we're it's still an ongoing process, and it's I mean it's not the full collection of the full fashion history, but it creates an, an idea of of what has been worn and dressed and made throughout these times. And it, I just I just like this image because you see like this very nice development of of, of fashion. Anyway, next slide. So aside from these collections. Um, or these collections function as like a starting point, but what Modemus is more about is about how can we adapt this information and re uh, repurposing or requestion it. So what what we have is very broad um, community or very uh, yeah a diverse community from all different disciplines, a very interdisciplinary community. So people who are who look at uh, researchers who look at fashion from a game perspective or from archaeology or from restoration, but also people uh, such as Micah just mentioned, just makers who, who not per se the, the biggest uh, avant-garde uh, makers, but, but also like the neighbor could, can write a blog about something the person uh, knows about or so, so with that with that information filling the collection and just question it and re, re um, reconceptualizing it also in a way so with all these interdisciplinary uh, approaches you create a really interesting dynamic of how can we look at these collections but also how um, how do we have a more broader um, vision of how we approach fashion Basically, also what Micah wants to do with her research, really uh, uh, creating a much more uh, interdisciplinary approach on how can you create or how can you look at sustainability. So my my role at Monomuse is having con uh, contacting or uh, being in contact with with all the bloggers, with new potential bloggers. We have like I think every year. 30 or 40 uh, plus uh, bloggers or new bloggers, but now we have like a few hundreds of people who have blogged for Modern Music before. Um, and, and with, and yeah, so next slide. <laughs> so aside from that, we also uh, have 
many uh, we also do uh, a lot of projects, cultural projects, fashion related projects such as exhibitions. And I thought maybe to pick up on this exhibition because it ties really well into this team. In 2018, Lodemusia um, exhibited this uh, expo innovation, which was very, very much about how can we look at historical um, techniques or technologies from uh, which in that time was seen as very innovative, but not per se like the very cliche high tech um, uh, techniques. So next slide. You could think of uh, a zipper or you can think about uh, how suddenly the hi hat was the um, in club bar. Um, um, I forgot the term, sorry, but uh, how you can really use techniques to to um, adapt clothing pieces or how for example shins at the, in the 18th century was seen as such an innovative uh, textile sort or a technique to to get inspiration from so it's it's uh, it was a point where uh, yeah with all these informations and collections and everything placed next to each other you see that there's much information also on modem music. And um, and that would be very, I think, very interesting uh, to to use. For example, if if new students um, are interested, or or fashion designers, or what, who else is interested in creating new ways of imagining a sustainable fashion or imagining um, a future fashion, it, Moda Music could be a very interesting platform to create to to build uh, inspiration from but also to pick up on just as Micah says many students are not aware of of the 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 form or the the more historical um, ways how uh, technology has been used to to create clothing and just how many sources there still are and I wanted to pick up on one source because I find it, it's one of our popular blogs, but also uh, one of uh, uh, it's very an interesting um, team. It's about the the stockings, <clears throat> written by Hanneke van Sutten, curator at the Open Lucht Museum. And somewhere after the Second World War, uh, the stockings became very popular and accessible uh, due to nylon. Uh, the or the introduction of nylon in, or the popularization of nylon at the time. Um, and one stocking would cost approximately about 10 guilders, uh, which in a time was very expensive. So when you would have a ladder, I translated ladder and it's in English it says ladder. So film, please fill me in the comments if it has another term, but when there's like a, a hole <laughs> in the stocking, um, there was this machine or you could go to a shop to re repair it, but it was also really an uh, um, interesting machine that could repair it in a way that the stocking would be um, when you couldn't see the ladder. And there's a really interesting video also I want to show and I hope it is um, the technology haha, um, <laughs> helps us. <laughs> I think Mike is, is now um, going to switch the presentation to a YouTube link. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. All right. It's in Dutch though, uh, but it's it gives you a very visual um, presentation of of oh the sound is off. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's it's I can I can. Uh, so here we see a lady um, showing how uh, she would uh, repair her stockings. So she would place the stockings on um, the tool and then would look for the threads. And as she says, the way how stockings are constructed is similar to how uh, sweaters are constructed. So if you look, if you find the threads, uh, then the machine can um create uh, 
the, uh, uh, can stitch it back to, uh, and you can see it later on. Um, The camera is going to zoom in in a bit. <laughs> yeah, so now we can see it. The machine makes makes an. Uh, it, yeah. Roberto, yeah. can we find uh, this film at the website of Mode Music? If we're interested, yeah, I can. Okay. I can put the 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 blog wherein this yeah. film is also placed, but also the story is told. I can put it in the in the comment section in a ah, bit. Thank but, you. It would be nice. But what I really liked about this is that um, that that stalking becomes so much more personal. So it it becomes something where uh, um, which you adapt with the time you you update it you upgrade it even if if there is a ladder even if there is a hole and i really liked that uh, mentality or that attitude for for personalizing clothing so while we now would would buy new stocking in that time i thought it, i think it is very inspirational to see how um you would have let go so where in the stocking would mean so much uh, yeah would would have a connection to your uh, to how you want to dress, but also your identity in a way. And that very inspired me. Um, uh, we talked about uh, um, that. That inspired me to also share another story, a much more personal story, about uh, um, my grandmother, <laughs> um, which is the lady all the way on the left, and. Um, during um, the, the so this is approximately around the 70s and my uncle in in uh, who is standing there with the dungarees on uh, he uh, he wears his checkered uh, dungarees and during a research I was doing went through all these historical pictures of my family I noticed that this pattern uh, came back a lot of times so next slide um, it started as a trousers for my aunt, uh, and eventually it um, it began this a, a, a suit for one uncle, and then it got passed on to another uncle, and then it got you can see that on the right it got reshaped also, uh, probably because it was damaged or so. So what I what I find interesting is that the the store the that this garment was such a personal garment uh, also because it very you have to imagine in this time uh, these uh, clothing pieces I mean this is in rural West Portugal so very uh, in a time where in uh, in this in a dictatorship so we're in uh, access to fabrics and just to materials was very limited so when you had to create very innovative ideas on how to um, create clothing so my mother or my grandmother would make all these clothing pieces for all my uncles and the people in the surrounding because she was very passionate about it but also implicitly gave an opportunity for these clothing to be very personal so and and very personalized and uh, up until that the last part so eventually this this the, the trousers would be very damaged and then at the end it would probably be like uh, soon into um, into a, a pillow or the, the fabrics would be used as a clothing mat or a, um, a, um, cleaning material. So just, just up until like the last treads. So I really liked that attitude. Also, I wanted to 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 tell this story because today would be her ninety first ninety uh, first and uh, birthday. Unfortunately, she passed away. But I thought it was it it. It was an interesting. Uh, it's an interesting example of how we often would would think of technology or innovation from a more uh, avant-gardistic avant approach, or more 
urban approach uh, or more rich or like elite approach when there are just so many interesting examples even in the most rural places of the world such as this because imagine this is like in the middle of the nowhere of the nowhere <laughs> uh, but like even in these places you can see uh, a very interesting approach on innovation and it ties really uh, well into what Mike had just said about how we have to revaluating uh, the attitude from the past so this could be this and so many other examples or related examples could be a source of inspiration for that part of the attitude so that technology can also be an attitude. Um, so that was, uh, I think that was uh, my introduction on modem use, but also uh, maybe some food for thought for our um, conversation. I'm not sure if you are we going directly to the next to a thesis or should we first give the floor to this, the our guests to ask questions. I didn't find any questions in the chat, so if someone uh, feels the urge, please uh, speak up. I actually have a comment for Mike, but I can also wait. I don't know how long is the whole uh, talk. I can also wait until you're all finished. Oh, it's fine. <laughs> okay. uh, yesterday, uh, thank you very much. It's really nice to know what you are going to do in your postdoc. I'm really happy that you that you organized this. Um, yesterday, I was in an event by Circle Economy, who are working in a project uh, for um, understanding what effects can circular um, proposals have in the work market in uh, in the Netherlands. So, how uh, promoting um, uh, better uses for waste and more repair and reuse and, and, and upcycling can uh, help uh, people that have been far from the work market to, to, uh, to get included again. And a big topic of discussion was the issue of loss of skills and the variety of skills that are needed when you are going to offer repair services for, you know, the variety of materials and, and repair uh, needs of each specific garment and the same for upcycling clothes. So for refurbishing or remaking, transforming old clothes in something new. And this seems for them like a big challenge, this lack of skills, the breadth of skills that is needed and of the, 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 the loss of technologies that were in other times used for these, you know, specific works. Um, so it seems to me that there can be a very interesting link there. Um, I can give you the contacts if you want, but I think, um, of course, it would be nice to promote um, the, the, uh, these values in new clothes, but even more urgent is the, the um, developments of skills and incorporation of technology for transforming post-consumer clothes in new clothes or for repairing clothes. There, I think there is a very uh, straight away, like a very direct link that can be that can be done. And there are people looking for answers there. So maybe there are interesting links. Great, great. That's a, that's a very interesting uh, tip, uh, Irene. Yeah, I think in, indeed uh, it's the loss of skills to repair. And I think also it's... Um, a loss of skills when you buy a garment because uh, you, you know in in, in 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 older days probably still in the 1970s or 80s uh when you're used to making your own clothes or your mother made her own clothes or, or you know your, your grandmother um you would recognize the quality of a fabric uh where i think nowadays for for for, for many if not most people um they don't recognize the quality, so they can't really, uh, when they are in a shop, think, okay, this will last me uh, one summer, or this will last me a lifetime. Uh, yeah, yeah, so I think it's both about the skills for repair and also sort of uh, um, recognizing quality and knowing that something will last longer than uh, a couple, couple of washes, although it looks very... Uh, <laughs> trendy in the, the the shop window of a, a Primark uh, or, or, or one of these companies. But th great, thank you for the tips. Thank uh, you. 
I'm not sure if it really ties into uh, what, your, um, what the point was, but uh, it, it reminded me a lot of how Levi's, for example, has this repairing place in the store where you can bring the your Levi's and where they can remake it or re um, yeah to 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 repair it uh, so that you can continue onwards. Uh, there's actually a one person who uh, a blog on Modemus about this, but I think that would be very inspirational also for not only for Levi's but just other retails places where automatically there would be a repair uh, section. Uh, where you could demonstrate that that repairing is not some uh, you don't have to go far to repair but it's actually very much in your face um, um, because nor I, I, I mean for my experience I don't think I've ever been to a repair uh, place also because my mother would repair my my clothing but also because the store uh the stores would be very hidden or it, it's very inaccessible uh, in my experience so to merge that into the retail that would be amazing uh to see also okay thank you both i see joyce has uh, uh, raised her hand but also mike boats has a question yeah uh, first, Joyce, maybe, then you can... Yeah, maybe it's more a comment, and but also a question. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Mike and Roberto, for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation. And um, I'm the uh, communication advisor of the Knowledge Center, so I'm a little bit surprised that so few so people few are people present. Are present. Uh, and um, I, I want to see, uh, uh, I'm very happy that we are, um, uh, that we also uh, um, recording this, uh, uh, this food for thoughts. And uh, so I want to see if we uh, can share the, the, the film afterwards uh, with, uh, uh, with other, with people uh, through uh, different channels if you agree and uh, but but uh, I also wonder um, the, uh, which target groups uh, are benefit of your project uh, if there is a very clear uh, description um, with who you want to work with and uh, what do you expect from them as well so maybe you can tell something about that as well. Uh, well, I think it, 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 the target group is uh, quite uh, broad. Uh, as I said, that there are elements of the research, or probably from the uh, results of the research, that uh, could be very interesting for for consumers, uh, for students, uh, for professionals and also for technology. So, so I'm trying to sort of uh, reach a, a very diverse group of uh, people um, on, 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 on different levels. For one person, it could be just, you know, uh, thinking about um, how to do fashion differently uh, and, and learning this new attitude of, of looking at, at, at fashion and, and, and dealing with it. Uh, whereas at you know the other side of the spectrum, uh, it could be a source of inspiration for actual high tech uh, innovations. So so for, for for big brands. Thank you. I see we have sort of two minutes left, um, or maybe we have some five minutes more. Uh, Maya Boats, you also had a question for Roberto. Like otherwise I will uh, see what. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the question for me is how to involve uh, students, or am I am I uh, you know uh, thinking about involving uh, students? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, and I think that there are roughly two two pathways. Um, 
One is I, uh, um, I supervise a lot of um, uh, graduation students from different uh, uh, dimensions at AMFI. So this could be uh, fashion designers, but also uh, more, more managers or branders. Um, and also I want to include uh, um, students in the, the expert meetings. So when, you know, I, I, I want to bring together uh, designers, historians, uh, etc. And also every time include uh, students. Um, because I think um, they always offer a very fresh perspective. Whereas we as professionals are sort of, you know, going like this. Uh, students often uh, ask, yeah, but why do we do it this way? Or why is this the case? So I think that, that they, they, they are also, they're always a very big um, yeah, contribution to, to, to um, these sorts of discussions. Uh, and also I think, I think for the students it's interesting because they uh, function within a, a more professional uh, context as much like you would do uh, during an internship. Okay, and um, I see we're we're better. Sorry, to see. yeah, yeah. Of my my microphone, uh, and the question for me was about how how the experience was of Modemus working with MBO students. Um, so um, in the past, uh, we've had multiple times wherein we worked with um, students from the MBO uh, for the, I have to be honest because I, I am a year, I'm only, it's actually somewhere this month that, that I celebrate my one year anniversary as a, a community manager. So I don't know all about the former experiences with uh, the MBO students, but so far I, I, I have understood is that Modemus really uh, really likes to challenge how um, how information or how, yeah, so to really dive into a very broad spectrum of makers. Uh, so not only makers of Amphi or from, or from the HBO, but just makers such as people uh, connected to the uh, MBO studies, but also Amsterdam Fashion College. Um, uh, so the, wherein they talk, or or even with um, Muff Bay, wherein uh, they've created um, fashion shows uh, inspired by collections. So there is always this link to collection and how the collection um, inspires. Or for new work, <clears throat> so it's very much bound on in, um, much more the information, the, the uh, in how look at the in uh, the content of of collections. But I, to be honest, I don't know how. I, I think it was a lot of fun, <laughs> but I know there are also some um, projects online. Uh, I can send a link when when you can read more about uh, this 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 collaboration. You can find it as we speak. But okay, please thank you. forgive me for not giving the full answer uh, because I just uh, uh, unfortunately can't. Maybe it's food for thought for you together for some other time. Um, did you want to uh, end um, by some slides or uh, maybe uh, a, a short discussion for some minutes? How shall we? And the presentation? Uh, I think it depends on uh, uh, everybody's uh, time. That is like I see so some of them had to, to leave already. Yeah, some, yeah. some people had to leave. So uh... maybe we could uh, do one one of the teas and just see how um, because we prepared two two teases. Let's take one of them. Yeah. Here it is. Exactly. Yeah, so moving forward from um, um, yeah, this idea of sort of uh, um, um, re remaking or, or, or mending clothing, um, Roberto and I 
came to the question, well, is it is it relevant for all sorts of clothing or only for sort of special? Oh, I see it misses it misses a T. Sorry about that. Special garments. <laughs> um, so because often what we see is that uh, for special garments, people make choose, seem to make an uh, an exception, so to say, so that so they have them uh, repaired. Um, but then is it a solution so sort of for, for a mainstream or every garment or, or is it really uh, specific? Yeah, what, uh, we came to this because also because, because of the story of how um, cloning can be so personal. I mean, how for a long time one outfit would really um, symbolize your identity at the time because of the lack of so many uh, lack of material and lack of um, access in that sense. So I was really I was wondering, um, can we use that information or experiences from the past to look at how we can still find some of the? I mean, it's probably impossible to. Well, it's not impossible, but uh, for a mass uh, group, it it would be more efficient to. I would propose to be more efficient to choose particular clothing pieces wherein you really feel like it has a link to your identity and something you really want to continue on wearing, uh, but but being open to techniques wherein you can repair it and readapt it without uh, throwing it away and buy a new example, because that's what happens. Uh, for example, I know someone who buys each year a new flare pants because it just rips each each time. Uh, but for the person, the flare pants is such a um, important part of her, how she sees herself, but also how she wants to um, dress. And, and she says, yeah, I need to have at least a few of them. So I was, I, I really try and want to challenge us and to think how can we, what ways could we push that uh, attitude? Who wants to comment? Maybe Maike or Marije? Joyce? Yeah, I, I think uh, um, indeed, you know, to do something yourself uh, needs uh, um, yeah, motivation or passion and of course you know if it's a special garments you're more willing to uh, repair or you know uh, 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 wash it by hand or well, etc etc um, so I think in, in that sense maybe it's only for special garments um, however if a, a certain uh, technique would be um, translated uh, in more of a high tech tech technology and be picked up by bigger brands so for example you don't have to you know the, it's it's a bit like with the stockings uh, if you have to do it yourself probably you know of course at that time they were quite expensive but then there's more of an uh, a bridge to cross to do it yourself than when you go to the shop and you hand it in and you get it back uh, uh, fixed again. Um, and I think, um, yeah, that if it, if it becomes a part of the, 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 uh, of a brand uh, and, and how they uh, sell their garments and you say, well, you can always bring it back and we repair it or you can always bring it back and you get another one and then they do something, you know, to, uh, uh, to, 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 to upcycle uh, the, the previous garment, uh, then it becomes quite easy for, for, for the average consumer or their masses. Um, and I think it's, it's a bit like um, that for certain objects, we buy everyday objects. Uh, in the past, maybe you would have to look a lot, uh, uh, everywhere to get a, a certain uh, sustainable solution. Uh, but nowadays, uh, um, maybe you would you would you know you would have a hard time to find uh, uh, non-ecological uh, uh, socks or whatever at at Hema or whatever. Um, for example, you know, of course, now I'm all into uh, the baby clothing, and uh, a lot of it is made from bio cotton. Um, 
And basically, you don't have a choice whether you go to Hema or Zeeman or Sena or whatever. It's all from uh, organic cotton. Um, so I think this could illustrate, you know, how uh, when these techniques or, or, or perspectives or, or approaches are picked up by the industry, these could maybe be, you know, in, in, in the future become the new norm. Which, and, and just make it not only for special garments, but for every garment. Yeah. Let's go for it. <laughs> <laughs> But I would suggest uh, we are 10 minutes late now. Uh, yeah. Uh, or Mariah, did, did you want to say something? I just wanted to say that I, I popped in later and I'm very sorry for that. And I missed a big part of the presentation. So that is why also I, 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 I hesitated a bit about asking questions. But I wanted to say that I, um, I, I work as a project developer for uh, the Center of Expertise for Creative Innovation. And I'm really interested in hearing about what you're doing. And I uh, look for ways to connect it to maybe to other organizations within our uh, networks, our partners, um, to see if this this uh, wh what we can do with with this subject. But what I what came into my mind is the artistic repair shop. I don't know if you have heard about it. It was an initiative at Tolas Town last year. And uh, Bas Costas was one of the, the uh, designers that took really like ordinary, I think it was a t-shirt or, or something that I saw in a film back with a really easy uh, a piece of cloth uh, and he made an art piece out of it. So it created also extra value by upcycling it. And I really like this idea of the artistic repair shop that can also um, be expanded, I think, with uh, uh, and and um, connected to the the loss of skills maybe people have, and maybe to add there that the, a skills workshop or anything added to it because I think it was a very interesting concept. I liked it very much, but that's the yeah, only yeah. thing I can share right now, and and I will follow up later with you yeah. guys. Okay. <laughs> no problem. Thank you so much. Ready. And uh, it sounds good that Joyce wants to uh, spread this video um, to a broader audience afterwards. So that sounds good. For now, thank you both Mike and Roberto for this inspiring contribution. I think we learned a lot about uh, looking in a new way at fashion and sustainability. Especially I was triggered by uh, wearing my high heels not every day, but uh, one day and then <laughs> take my uh, sneakers again. Uh, Maaike, good luck with your postdoc research and um, enjoy your maternity leave. Roberto, we hope to see you again in person. Yeah. Thank you for now and uh, hope to meet you uh, again. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.